Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, you may press star 1 on your touchdown phone if you would like to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Sethi Arau. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. We have to go through these five slides in order for people to get continuing education credit. I'm not going to read those for you. Um, I'm just going to keep them up there for a few seconds so that you can see them and read them yourself. Now that we are done with that, it gives me tremendous pleasure to be done with the continuing education stuff, but it gives me tremendous pleasure and honor to actually be here introducing to you Ward Cates, who is one of my mentors uh, in my career. Ward uh, graduated from Yale uh, in 1964, earned an Ehrman Scholarship uh, to King's College in Cambridge where he was for two years getting a master's degree in history. His undergraduate was in history as well, in case you don't know that. Um, he then went back to Yale to get a combined MD and PH degree. He did his clinical training at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And in 1974, he joined CDC and became, after doing EIS, became the chief of the abortion surveillance branch uh, in reproductive health. I guess it was called family planning at that time. Um, then in 1982, he became the director of the division of STD, just as HIV was beginning to spread. And so uh, he directed the division of STD, HIV prevention, actually. Both were combined uh, under his uh, directorship. And they got separated again. Those of us who have been here long enough remember when Judy Wasserheit was division director here. Um, after, the direct, after being the director of the SCDP, he became director of the training division at CDC. And in 1994, he joined FHI, which was Family Health International at the time. He still is there. However, now the agency is called FHI C60. He is board certified in preventive medicine with focus on epidemiology. He has professorial appointments at the University of North Carolina, University of Michigan School of Public Health, and Emory University. He um, has over 400 publications. He has too many awards uh, for me to list here including the Thomas Parent Award from uh, ASCDA. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine, and he was selected uh, to be a distinguished alumnus at Yale University within the past two years, I think, or three or something. Um, I just found out, I, I was trying not to ask him for a CV because I felt embarrassed after having known him this many years. I didn't think it would be cool to ask him for a CV, so I started Googling him, uh, which is the new way of asking for someone's CV, right? I'm keeping up with technology. And he has done a um, kind of like a self-portrait for the Society of Epidemiological Research. If you're interested in finding out who Dr. Ward Cates really is, I suggest you Google him, go to Ward Cates and SER, and read his personal odyssey. It's quite interesting. What I learned from reading that, though, um, was very important. I learned why Ward is a population-level public health thinker. And apparently, the history goes back to his years in England, where he had more time to think and no time to work, which is supposed to be just the opposite of what happens in the space, where you have so much work to do that you have no time to think. And I think I agree with him. But anyway, there he started uh, reading into Jeremy Bentham's work, uh, where he got acquainted with the philosophy of the greatest good for the greatest number. And he is into greatest self-good 
for the greatest number in public health and combines the fields of reproductive health, HIV, and STD. Ward, please. Thanks so much, Sepki. That was the nicest introduction. And in the, what Sepki didn't tell you is of the publications, about two of them, 200 of them, have been co-authored with her. But uh, we, in that we began as colleagues literally in the STD division at almost the same time within several months of each other and sort of grew up together in the STDs. I don't know how that sounds. Um, but, but at any rate, uh, she gave you a little background as to my history uh, degrees and interests. And certainly as one uh, gets wiser, I never say older these days, wiser, history becomes much more a part of life and therefore uh, uh, even more relevant. Um, and thanks so much for the honor to uh, CDC, to ASHA, to ASTDA uh, for giving this talk because it really allowed me to try and put my career that Becky just described in a nutshell and, and come up with what does this all mean as we try to look at where we are, eight, uh, August 29, 2012, in the area of uh, sexual and reproductive health, including SDD, HIV. So with that, and, and in different contexts. And she's right. I really do always uh, gravitate, default even, to being a population-level thinker. And what I'm going to be describing is this intermix between what is one of the more fundamental individual choices that people make, which is what method of contraception would they be using or what, number one, do they or do they not want to get pregnant? And then if they do or do not, what contraceptive do they choose in order to best protect them against pregnancy and best protect them against a risk of a sexually transmitted infection? Okay, well, here goes. Uh, I start with acknowledgments because when most people give them at the end, people are too tired even to realize who have been the ones who contributed to one's life and one's work. And I am population level, so therefore acknowledging in a group form. But whether they be colleagues that I'm working with now, colleagues, many in the audience who I worked with during CDC days, a few with one of our key funders in at least this area, USAID, several of whom used to be EIS officers as well, and many, many more, including the previous uh, speaker in this symposium series, uh, Jeannie Morazzo. So this is truly something that the whole village has contributed to, and thanks so much. When we're talking about the three cultures, we're really talking about the family planning field, the STD field, and a subsection of both, HIV. There are really three cultures, as we've learned over even the past 30 years, uh, with um, HIV and STD having slightly different, so over, certainly overlapping interests, and no difference in this talk today. But when we're talking about what are the risks of sexual, uh, sexual intercourse, and we define them, them then as infection or unintended pregnancy. Uh, and looking at it by a risk of one single act of a discordant couple, where one of them is infected and they're fertile, because don't forget we're talking about pregnancy. The infection side, the risk is very much determined by the organism or by the, the disease, with the traditional bacterial diseases having the highest risk for a coital event. Uh, chlamydia being somewhat lower, and HIV, if cofactors being measurable at least on this per 100, and cofactor, main cofactor is viral load, as you guys know. For pregnancy, it's really where in the menstrual cycle does that one act of intercourse occur. If around ovulation, the risk is about one in, in three of getting pregnant, and then less so as you get toward the periphery of the, of, of the menstrual cycle. But we can also look at that a slightly different way. And I'm showing this to you because we'll be coming back to it in one of uh, our, net, our future slides. We can look at it if in the course of a year you have 
a discordant couple having the proverbial two acts of intercourse a week, a uh, hundred times per year, when in the course of that year would they become either infected or pregnant? And if with, within the first month for the traditional bacterial STDs, uh, at the end of the month for chlamydia, in the middle of spring for the uh, to transmit pregnancy, thinking of it that way, and not till the end of the year, if with cofactors, if with a high viral load even, uh, uh, for HIV or males with foreskin or another STD or other any of the cofactors that will raise their HIV risks. So all of these are somewhat different in terms of their transmission risk. Well, what am I going to talk about today in context? Remember, that's the underlying theme of, of, of today's talk. First of all, thinking about life from a, a woman's standpoint of a reproductive life cycle, not an entire life cycle, I'll show you in a minute, what contraceptives are available to try and prevent adverse consequences of, uh, of, of sex during that time, and then to drill down on two scientific issues. Uh, each one, somewhat ironically, being generated as an issue uh, by forces of the right for condoms and forces from the left for hormonals and HIV. Play that into the background as we start talking about them. And then taking these ideologic findings, the evidence presented in the realm of ideologic uncertainty, and trying to craft policy out of how we uh, uh, how we approach different STDs and pregnancy to a particular context, whether it's a temporal context, whether it's a population context, and even whether it's an individual context. Well, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about stages of a woman's reproductive life? This is a wonderful concept uh, presented initially by Jackie Derrick, named Forrest in those days, uh, and of course, life begins with birth and ends in death. That makes sense to you guys. And, but a reproductive life begins with menarche and ends with menopause from the standpoint of the woman. And within that reproductive life, arbitrarily, uh, Dr. Derrick has defined it in five stages that I have updated slightly in terminology based on today's uh, demographic factor. Stage one goes from menarche to coitarche, great term I think I first heard from Seti, but the, but, uh, the first intercourse. Um, stage two, from intercourse to stable partner. That had been initially in the 80s first marriage, interestingly. Now it's really stable partnership. First birth, from partnership to birth, from first birth to completion of family, stage four. And then the longest reproductive interval is actually from completion of family to menopause. Now, each one of these totally arbitrarily defined stages that mix and match in different cultures and certainly with different individuals has its own particular behavioral and fertility goals that form the context in which individual choices and population policies tend to be formed. In stage one, the abstinence stage, if you want to think of it that way, no partners, no coitus as far as behaviors, and the goal, the long-term goal, is to preserve fecundity, the ability to get pregnant, and to postpone birth. By stage two, coitarsh, the stable partner, whatever that means, one of my favorite lines was actually given in this town about 25 years ago to Georgia Tech and giving a face sex lecture or something and talking about the jargon of the day, mutual monogamy, and um, mutual serial monogamy. And they said, Dr. Cates, Dr. Cates, what does that mean? As long as a semester? Okay. Well, I didn't write it. Um, at any rate, uh, we're talking about multiple partners in, those, in that interval, uh, moderate frequency, moderate predictability, behaviorally, and again, the goal, as it was earlier, preserve the ability to get pregnant and postpone births. 
on to phase three, stable partner, the first birth. One partner, high frequency sex, high predictability of sex, affecting at least some of the contraceptive choices, still preserve fecundity and postpone birth. Stage four, uh, still completed family size, still largely one partner, uh, moderate frequency, high predictability, same goal, but space births at this point because you've already had one. And finally, for the longest interval, stage five, I'd say one plus partner just because it's a longer stage, moderate or low frequency uh, sexual behavior and high predictability as one gets wiser probably. Uh, but fecundability at this point is not important, so it, it, it expands the range of choices, and the goal is to stop childbearing. Remember, uh, we at this point in that rendition, completed family size. So in order at each of these phases or contexts, what are the contraceptive options that are available? But before we do that, I really want to emphasize that what we're talking about at all levels in this is beginning with fertility intention. And all too often, i found, not all, always in this country, but in a lot of countries, when you're fixated on an infection outcome, the fertility outcomes of clients before you sometimes get lost in translation. And therefore, the most important aspect about approaching uh, women that you're considering what is are their sexual health choices is to start with what do they want to do at this point in time? What is their fertility goal on the right side of those phases that I showed you? If they say to you the simple question, do you currently want to get pregnant? Yes or no? Not always a simple answer, but let's just assume it's dichotomous. If she desires pregnancy, then let's get her into pre-conceptual counseling. How do you increase her metabolic and how does she actually know the best time to get pregnant to use that as an education uh, uh, interval. But if she says, as we're talking about now with the contraceptive HIV arena, no, she doesn't want to get pregnant, at that point the range of contraceptive options takes over and for the purposes of one of the scientific issues, the options are hormonal or other methods. So it all begins with fertility intention, and here are the methods of the uh, 15 methods that WHO has come up with to the right. Uh, they go in sort of four tiers of effectiveness from the most effective, less than one pregnancy occurring a year, to the least effective, uh, of, of 30 pregnancies per year using withdrawal or spermicide. But the most effective ones, which are now in family planning terms, the long-acting and reversible, except for the two on the right, the sterilization, long-acting contraceptives um, are what a colleague at CDC or uh, David Grimes calls forgettable contraception. In other words, they really do not require uh, a daily or even a three-month or an event-driven choice. But in the areas of the world where my organization works, in the low-resource settings, we usually have about four methods widely available, even within many of these highly funded HIV prevention trials that we do a lot of work in, which are really condoms, which are great, but have uh, adherence issues. Uh, injectables, which will be the focus of some discussion. Uh, and that's lactac lactational, uh, which certainly uh, works during that breastfeeding interval in oral contraceptives. This is what is in the real world available. Now another concept in choosing contraception is this balancing of adherence risks together with those condoms, male and female, that have the best record of pregnancy prevention, but as you saw, only a third tier record of contraceptive effectiveness. Um, but those with the best pregnancy effectiveness have no SDI protection. And then dividing that between what happens in the real world of difficult adherence, that condoms provide moderate and inconsistent use, moderate protection against both pregnancy and SDI. But we can talk about what happens with the perfect user, uh, direct and consistent use, 
where there are good protection against both of these outcomes of sexually transmitted, of, of, of sexual uh, uh, intercourse. Okay, just to keep that in mind. And now we're going to drill down on what are some of the um, scientific questions of these two key areas. The first is what about condoms and STI HIV acquisition? Well, I'm going to start with one of my favorite studies of all time. This was done by King Holmes when he was in the Navy. You can believe it, he was, he was ever that young. Just teasing if you're listening, King. Um, but uh, at any rate, this was a, uh, a randomized controlled trial of minocycline given at post-exposure prophylaxis to Navy seamen who went on shore leave, did what Navy seamen do on shore leave, come with sex workers in the Philippines, come back, walk up the gangplank, and are immediately interviewed and, of course, voluntarily consented into this randomized control trial. And they are interviewed as what was their behavior during their shore leave. And here you're randomized to minocycline or placebo. Now, this is not a study of that trial. It was actually published by Will Harrison in the New England Journal in 1979, and actually minocycline worked, but had such side effects it never got really advocated as post-exposure prophylaxis. But this isn't about the randomized trial. This is about the cohort, the, the cohort that received the placebo, no antibiotics. And we, and uh, Rich Hooper at the time published, with Gladys Reynolds, published a, who was the statistician at CDC, uh, when Stepke and I got there, uh, a, a, an article in American Journal of Epidemiology in which they were looking at gonorrhea rates as the main outcome. And in doing the analysis of did guys who say they used condoms while on shore leave get gonorrhea, they did the analysis, and in the article, famously, it said condoms uh, provided almost no protection or no significant protection which was true because it didn't reach the traditional level of statistical significance. Why? Because there were so relatively few outcomes overall of gonorrhea and so relatively few condom use. But then, in the longest ever letter to the editor of all time, between 1978 and 1995, Dr. Cates and Holmes got on the bandwagon and King dug out of his paper files some of you remember those days, uh, the complete study, and we looked at it by lumping together outcomes, not just gonorrhea, but also NGU, and whoop, the power went up a little bit because we had more outcomes, and we looked at and had this table. And among those who had self-reported, not knowing whether they had gonorrhea or not, self-reported condom use, in a very easy-to-transmit uh, bacterial infection, we had no, none, gonorrhea infection. And to me, that is one of the more compelling, though still level 2-2 evidence, we'll get into that in a moment, uh, indications that, wait, with as good uh, ascertainment evidence as we can get as far as adherence, because they didn't know outcomes. There really was not the attempt to say you had used them if you didn't, just did you or did you not. No infection, and it did reach the level of traditional statistical significance, doing the epi thing that we all love to do. Well, let's look at condoms in the latest Cochrane Review by uh, Weller and Davis Beatty, 2009. These are heterosexual discordant couples, and they compared all self-reported always to self-reported never users. And epidemiologists love consistency, and this is a rendition of the relative risk. On the left-hand side, it's protective if the dot is there. On the right-hand side, it's harmful. No, no effect is that famous line one in the middle. And what we have are going down the row of uh, various um, uh, discordant couple studies. If Dr. Peterman had asked the question of different never users or something like this, we would have had Dr. Peterman study in there as well. But the point is that um, uh, this is as consistent a protective effect across uh, cohort studies as you're going to find using 
this type of comparison. So condoms do work. And let's go back to, oh, this is, now this is another rendition that we put together out of the uh, Weller and Davis uh, Cochran study. Of those who were, um, said they were consistent users, lumped together, the HIV incidence was, it was less than one. If you self-reported, always use. If you self-reported, never use, the risk overall of HIV in these discordant couples was 6.5. But what about the so-called inconsistent users that, as you know, then fall from a 1 to 99 percent user from because the two poles are 0 or 100, supposedly? Well, if you're an inconsistent sometimes user, your risk of getting infected falls closer to the never user than uh, the self-reported always user. And as you uh, meta-analyze the overall from more than just those uh, selected uh, references I showed you on the previous slide, the overall condom effectiveness at a population level in these studies among discordant couples came down at 80%. So here was the, what happens in the course of a year among a discordant couple. Um, uh, but what if it is protected by condoms? That whole x-axis moves to years rather than months. So there is a population level protection that can be measured in terms of, if you want to think of it this way, time to infection extended from months to years or extended, and this is the most complicated slide I'll show you uh, uh, today, taken from an article that I was trying to um, emulate, Jeffrey Rose's rendition of chronic disease. And let's just take you through this very slowly. On the y-axis is the likelihood of STD acquisition. On the x-axis is over time going up to years. Uh, if you are abstinent over time, you have no risk of uh, pregnancy or infection, no risk of infection or pregnancy. And uh, so that's the lower level bar of no risk of STD acquisition. If you have unprotected sex, uh, making some assumptions from transmission study, your risk goes up slightly faster at the beginning of time and then levels off over time. And if you have protected sex with condoms, that curve moves from concave to convex, and we have the additional risk over time prevented by condoms, another way of showing it in a graphic way. And still, and this was done early in 2000s when there was the trade-off was condoms aren't perfect, therefore you have to be abstinent, the right was emphasizing. So they were right. If you were abstinent, you were home free as far as risks of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infection, not necessarily in terms of human pleasure or procreation. But at any rate, uh, there, this is just a rendition of what are the elements of protection over time at a population level of condoms versus abstinence in almost a disinhibition sense. So condoms are the ultimate context-specific uh, prevention tool. And at the individual level, we have evidence of uh, youth being in that stage two much more likely because of their spontaneous and oftentimes unpredictable greater use of condoms, in part mostly if you look at the studies to prevent pregnancy, but as a wonderful side effect, if used by a, consistently by youth, prevents STI. But, and also we see that there is, at the individual level, because of such factors as trust, there's tendencies toward lesser individual level condom use with primary partners. And at the population level, we see the use of Thailand's 100% condom policy having a definite measurable effect on both STI and HIV, and yet at the population level, because of a variety of factors, lower condom uh, use in Africa. So it is a context-specific method. On to the issue du jour. Du jour, really, the ane, because it began uh, well over a year ago. Now, when it comes to hormonal contraception and HIV, uh, you have uh, 
now over 2 billion women of reproductive age, uh, 18 million of whom are HIV infected, and injectable progestin, what we'll focus in on, uh, Depo-Provera or NetN, uh, injectable progestin are increasing rapidly, especially in the higher HIV prevalence area. And there are biologic reasons, whether they be anatomic or physiologic or immunologic or microbiologic or pharmacologic reasons as to why these particular progestins may be associated. Again, this is all biologic plausibility conjecture why they may be associated with higher risks of HIV. And just to look very quickly here, this these vicissitudes of oral contraceptive use in the orange uh, are because it's a daily ing ingestion of steroids that peak in the course of 24 hours. The green bar here is the ingestible, ingest, injectable uh, uh, the depo provera, depo, the MPA. Um, and this comes with very high levels in the first month that then decrease over the three months, uh, but always remain above that gray bar at the bottom, which is the uh, contraceptive effectiveness range. So that's one reason why Depo is thought to be different than some of the other injective or some of the other types of progestin, whether they be uh, biodegradable pellets, whether they be here in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, that would be, uh, here is the implant, the uh, uh, two-year implant, and here would be the uh, biodegradable, the ideal biodegradable pellet that we're, we're aiming at uh, in doing some research. At any rate, it all began about a year ago at the IAS meeting in Rome with a wonderful presentation by the University of Washington colleague, um, Rene Heffron, that a lot of us attended and became concerned about, but it got no, zero traction because it was sort of preempted by the 052 uh, interest of the day, the, uh, the HPTN 052 treating the infected partner. So it wasn't until the first week of October that this analysis was actually published, got to the front page of the New York Times, and then as happened, it went viral. And here is the type of uh, newspaper headline that spread immediately within 24 hours. And then in the second range, it went to uh, the low-resource countries. And just like telling a secret around a circle, the whole message changes as you try to simplify with um, headlines. Right here in, this is the, the Nairobi paper, you have um, contraceptives, no distinction of type of contraceptives, double HIV risk as almost a certainty. Now, if you're reading this paper not knowing what I'll show you in a minute, which is the weaknesses of observational data, you're going to say, oh, my heavens, and stop using probably whatever contraceptive you're using, regardless of what it is. This was a wonderful study, and, and it was actually to look at uh, can you treat herpes to prevent HIV transmission? but then followed up, as good researchers do, with a lot of secondary analysis. So this, this analysis now of HIV-negative women, about less than a quarter who were using uh, hormonal contraception, uh, either combined oral contraceptives or DEPO, when you looked at their risk of HIV infection, HIV-negative women, came out, came out to be about twofold, whether oral or injectable contraception. And then when we do that, putting these all these studies on a slide, as this wonderful colleague at USAID has done both uh, over the last year and updated it uh, at age 2012, you see that when you look at combined oral contraceptives put on a slide, we don't form, we don't have a consistent picture like we did for condoms, where they were almost all protected. They're scattered over and on either side of one. So again, remember we love consistency. Here is consistent inconsistency for orals. For injectables, it's waiting a little bit more to the side of harmful, but still not totally clear, which then gets us into what are observational studies all about, and if there's one thing that we groove on as largely observational epidemiologists here at CDC, uh, please 
back in the days when I was there, it was um, lots of observational epidemiology and what does it all mean anyway because you have uh, all of these factors that can affect in one way or the other, especially low risk effect uh, measures, uh, whether it be selection bias. But the main one I'll show you in a minute is what is the non-hormonal group consistent of? So let's just look for a minute. Why could we have spurious associations in these particular comparisons? Remember, you're looking at a hormonal group versus a non-hormonal group. And in general, most populations not using hormones are using much higher levels, they have much higher levels of condom use as their non-hormonal contraception. So using that, if you look at just injectable users, DMPA versus non-users, with injectable users, not using condoms, uh, there's direct exposure to HIV. And with non-users who also don't use condoms, there's direct exposure to HIV. So at least at that level, you're comparing apples to apples. But if they're largely condom users, which in some of the better studies they are, you have a reduced exposure to HIV because you remember those slides I showed you earlier on condoms and SPDs? You're using a protective device. And why is that important? Well, don't forget what relative risks are. Relative risks are, cert are only comparisons of one group versus another. And here are four possible scenarios of what we're looking at. And the one that we usually think of is, aha, the usual comparison group is the index case, the square here, the non-hormonal group, and we usually plant it at the top here with an index rate of 1. So anything to the riskier of an assumed index case of 1 is going to be seen as harmful. But wait, what if the non-hormonal group, because it has a percentage of condom users, actually is protected? You still have that same difference here in the second row, but it's much less risky than it was if you assume this is one. Oh, but wait, let's go down to the third here. Suppose these condoms are really protective, and this group uses them a lot. Then it could be that the depo group has no risk, and all we're measuring is the protective effect of the comparison group. And finally, highly unlikely, but always possible when we do these models, Suppose they are both effective and both protective, and all we're, again, measuring is the same absolute difference between the two groups. And this is what makes ideologic reasoning either so difficult, or if you come from this crucible of observational epidemiology, CDC, so much fun. Randomized controlled trials are boring. They just give you the right answer and truth. Okay. Um, now, what about pregnancy? Now, don't forget, we're now talking about women who don't want to get pregnant. Let's go to that same study and think of the same context, women who desire pregnancy. It all begins with per fertility desire or don't desire pregnancy. We have hormonal or other, and what if they become pregnant? Same database, that herpes, HIV, discordant couple database of the University of Washington, Analyzed by the stand, from the standpoint of pregnancy and risk, not hormonal contraception and risk. Now, it's interesting, I presented this slide several times, we'll say, I realized only today in rehearsing that there were a higher percentage of pregnancy in this cohort of HIV uninfected women, 29%. Remember, there was less than a quarter even using hormonal contraception interesting little factoid within this particular cohort. But what did they find? They found that, wow, being pregnant had about a two-fold increased risk of becoming infected just like using hormonal contraception. Oh, wow. Now you get really into some difficult choices. HIV infection versus the risks in many settings of becoming pregnant with an unintended pregnancy and the associated risks there, including HIV infection. So what's an uninfected woman to do? If she uses hormonal contraception, she'll have less risk of pregnancy, but possibly, remember that etiologic reasoning we've just done, more risk of HIV acquisition. If she becomes pregnant, possibly more risk of HIV acquisition and Definitely more risk of pregnancy complications if she lives in a high in a high 
pregnancy morbidity and mortality area, unsafe pregnancy area. Uh, what is she to do? Well, come on. Damned if she does and damned if she doesn't in terms of choosing effective methods. So amidst all of this, there was this gathering that uh, we had uh, CDC colleagues at as well, uh, Kate Curtis and Polly Marchbank, uh, in uh, about now uh, six months ago in Chile, Geneva, late January, and we were looking at all of these data and what were we going to recommend and how were we going to change the contraceptive guidelines, if at all. And I don't know, how many of you here now are used to using the grade criteria for judging the quality of evidence around any type of issue? Anyone? Going to be, Dr. Boland says, it, okay, well, get ready because it is a ruthless way of judging. Uh, okay, the, for those of you who want a, a first experience with this, Go to Lori's experience in looking at HPV findings for the Immunologic Practices Group. I'm trying to avoid all types of acronyms. It's very hard for me. Um, but uh, the grade context actually looks at the available evidence. And the most important thing to remember in this is that randomized controlled trials begin at high quality, and if they're weekly done, they ratchet down. Observational studies begin at low quality, and if well done, they get ratcheted up. So using that group, they went to the available evidence that I showed you uh, that Chelsea Polis and Kate Curtis had summarized, and they found that only eight cohort studies met minimum cohort study quality criteria. But even with that, all as a group had serious limitations. And it was rated overall, low overall quality. And then, for those of you who were at uh, D.C. about a month ago, this was updated by both Chelsea and Renee, the, da the data um, there. Still, however, it would remain low overall quality. So that here, what was this group to do? Seventy-five individuals from varied backgrounds, uh, from the most biologic to the most public health, from the most north to the most south, and so on. Seventy-five people there, literally riveted trying to decide on what were the eligibility criteria for the DMPA. Should we change those in high HIV prevalence settings or for women at high risk of HIV? Something we'll come back to very quickly. Did the new evidence justify a change? If left, I'm not, I haven't gone through the categories, not enough time, but if left at one, which is no restriction, then that would mean that the MPA has a clean bill of health and that these data should have no concern. Then if left category two, it would imply that these low quality data were strong enough to have a change in definition, which went against the traditional uh, type of approach. And in that room of 75 people, there was a total bell-shaped curve of opinion from those who, I mean, light Congress. You had the Tea Party on one side and you had the, whatever the other side is. And, uh, and, and then you had all the, moderates in the middle, which I confess I totally am. Uh, even with my, in my FHI college, we had four of us there. We had one diehard, leave it at one, and we had one diehard, change it to two, and two of us were 1.5. Okay. So, uh, you know, this, this is what makes policy making totally fun. Well, in a record time, the, the WHO has never come out with a document in two weeks and my prediction is never will again. But it came out in two weeks with this document, and its solution was leave it at Category 1, no restrictions, but define in eloquent terms how the evidence that I've just shown you is inconclusive. And finally, uh, clarifying that the women at high risk, this category, should be strongly urged to use condoms, as if they weren't before. But, uh, however, this is fascinating and led to lots of confusion about how do you communicate all of this ideologic uncertainty. So another gathering of community advocates and national leaders got together in much nicer surroundings of Montreux, Switzerland, overlooking the lake, but they were fierce. And, uh, and there was a candid discussion of evidence and interpretations and messaging, and the report from this was published a week before the AIDS Convention, and came out with 
basically the same recommendation, only extended it to policy. Well, wait a minute. We are in the United States. How does all this brouhaha over in Geneva or Montreux, how does that affect us? Well, you may not know. We do have an equivalent of contraceptive guidelines in this country, much like the STD treatment guidelines, but DRH puts it together. Bases it a lot on what WHO has gone through and uh, looks at those 1,800 recommendations and in 2010 accepted the majority of them, but adapted some of them because of either intervening scientific evidence or because the U.S. context, emphasized context, is different. So what did CDC do with regard to this WHO recommendation? Had a conference call, had several of us who had been there, others who hadn't, uh, review uh, the, the WHO recommendations in light of the U.S. context. How does it differ from other parts of the world? Well, much lower risk of HIV incidents, even measured in the highest risk women in a study called HPTN 064. Uh, the, the depo use is much less common in this country, uh, higher in younger minorities, but still less than 10% of most contraceptive uh, programs. Much wider mix of contraceptive choices, including injectables and IUDs and others, and much safer childbirth and abortion practices. So when you put all of that together, does that affect things? Well, after the citing, we accepted it, and, and the statement came out in June. Here it was, nested in MMWR, and basically adopted, the U.S. adopted the WHO uh, recommendation. So now we have the, the world, the nation, coming together with a one asterisk for um, uh, use of Depo, especially injectables, NHIV. What does this really mean? Well, the WHO research recommendations were let's go to higher quality. Remember, we're dealing with low quality evidence, meaning RCT uh, uh, trials to try and answer the question. Uh, another rallying cry has multi purpose technologies or dual protection. And finally, uh, let's look even more at some of the biologic factors that could explain any association. And just so you know, when I put my cards on the table, I'm hesitant to say, though I love observation epidemiology because it's truly fun and you never have an answer and you can get into discussion ad infinitum. Uh, if you really want the truth, you have to go to an RCT, and therefore I think we ought to do one now, expensive as it is, to remove the biases, to upgrade the level of evidence, uh, because a lot of our even ongoing prevention trials uh, Women are using DMPA as their main method of contraception. The visibility is high, and we need high-quality evidence. Now, for women, what does this really mean? And this is where the Monco recommendation has, has legs. It begins, as I've said now, this is the third time, with what a woman wants. It all begins with her choices. But in order to have choices, she has to have contraceptive options. So on this alone, regardless of what truth is, increase options beyond those four that I showed you uh, in an earlier slide. Having her have access to full, accurate information and communicating it as clearly as possible, which is difficult in the face of ideologic uncertainty. But in the end of this, her right, her right to decide whether to become pregnant and what contraceptive to use is foundational to her. What does it mean for clinicians? We've talked about the difficulty of explaining this. Uh, ideologic uncertainty, um, and we've even tried to role model it in clear terms, and I become as befuddled as when confronting a role model client as any clinician, especially if there's an intelligent one who starts ferreting in on uh, some of the inconsistencies and how I've tried to explain, we don't know. Um, and uh, what are the pros and cons of contraception? And finally, can we even use that opportunity, too, as say, to increase method mix? Uh, and increase messages for safer sex for all women. For policies, uh, the programmatic recommendations are don't remove uh, injectable contraception. Women need those choices, especially if they only have a choice of four. But we do need to use this as an opportunity to expand method mix, and we need to integrate programs. What about for policymakers? Remember, each of these people, whether it's a women's lens, a clinician's lens, a policymaker's lens, different contexts, 
Uh, you begin with a foundational rights base. The method mix is the same. Let's move it. Let's purchase it. Let's get it cleared to regulatory bodies. Let's make it accessible. And let's emphasize and put dollars into research on dual methods. And let's integrate services. And in one sense, there has been, in the areas of the world where we work, some progress. Just look at the right-hand slide now. If you look between 2005, 2010 in Rwanda and Ethiopia, the percentage, the yellow bar circle of implants has been increasing in both those countries. But if you look at the blue bar, even in the most recent year, it shows you the differential distribution of injectables versus implants in today in the lower resource countries. And finally, remember we were doing all this for women at high risk. And that's sort of the ultimate context of what we deal with as public health practitioners. How do we target uh, our policies to particular context? Well, when we look at determinants, if you look at the individual level, Marcus Steiner and I tried to ferret this out when we were looking at dual determinants of dual protection, now upgraded to today's jargon, multi-purpose technologies. Um, uh, at the individual level, it's her or his own determination of the risk of HIV, SBI, and of pregnancy. And then her or his own determination of what would be the consequence and outcome of an unintended pregnancy as to this mix of kind of effectiveness versus um, lesser effective methods that might protect against STDs. And at the population level, you're not dealing with perception of risk of the individual. You're dealing with prevalence of these infections at the population. How do we take those into account? And at the population level, what are the pregnancy, morbidity, and mortality risks in terms of availability of safe abortion and childbirth? So how do we put this into context? Well, if you look at a percent of the population and its risk along a continuum, the x-axis is a continuum of risk, from no risk the risk ES, and determine it by different factors, clinical, behavioral, demographic, and epidemiologic. The lowest risk, tending toward zero, is if there are no symptoms or signs, no sexual activity, an uninfected partner, and even more crudely, older, stable partners in phases uh, three, four, and five, uh, and low prevalence. And the highest risk is whether you have symptoms and signs present, unprotected sex with infected partners, discordant couples, uh, younger, single, and high prep. Makes it easy to put it in text. Let's relate this to populations that we're dealing with broadly. The general population, the population sampled by uh, the National Survey of Family Growth, for example, tends toward the lower risk. The family planning clinic population, sexually active, therefore somewhat in the middle. The STD clinic population that a lot of you deal with tends toward the highest risk, signs, symptoms, younger, single, prevalence. So how do we use these populations to actually think of policy? Well, here they are now in the lower wing, and here's SPD management, contextual implications. In the general policy, we may say, hey, these risks are so low it doesn't warrant the cost of screening for any of this. In the family planning clinic population, we say, hey, wait, this is a good time. It's slightly higher. It's a convenient sample to screen. And in the high-risk STD population, there are times where we say, you know, we're just going to presumptively treat these people for the sake of avoiding spread within the community. For contraception, it's the same thing. You might say that for very low risk, don't even worry about anything having to do with IUDs, for example. For laboratory referral, for those in a family planning setting that might have slightly higher levels of a riskier vaginal or cervical infection. And finally, in the highest risk, use condoms. So, another way, epidemiologists, second to last slide, love two by two tables. So, think of this as my parting shot. Um, for HIV and for HIV prevalence versus pregnancy, remember that balance bar that we're trying to look at uh, for the women's choice? Come on, damned if she does and damned if she doesn't. At a policy level, uh, we can uh, think of this as low HIV prevalence, less than 1%, higher HIV prevalence, greater than 1%, low pregnancy risk, or high pregnancy risk. If you're low HIV, low pregnancy risk, really any contraceptive policy-wise uh, can be used. If it's still low HIV prevalence, 
any but high pregnancy risk, you want to avoid pregnancy. You want a highly effective method to emphasize. However, if you're in the higher HIV prevalence range, you, uh, if there's low pregnancy risk, you can still use any contraceptive method, but if the partner's infected or if the MPA is chosen, encourage condom. Likewise, uh, if there's high, high, you want your multipurpose technologies for dual protection with condom. Just one way of thinking simply about using context to make policy. So where do we stand here? The reproductive life cycle actually sets the contextual stage stage for women's choices. We have differences at the individual and population level between ideal and typical. We're in the throes of etiologic enigmas, which some of us love as our bread and butter, but others of us uh, would like some uh, to make that uh, go toward the truth uh, with, with uh, a higher quality evidence. And finally, we're in the reason we love public health so much is we're constantly in this sea of thinking about the dynamic use of evidence in context to make policy. Thanks so much for letting me talk to you about these today. And last but not least, if you want CME credit for this, uh, either near and far, um, this is how you get them. Why don't I, you know, these are the way to do it, and this is the way to access it. Maybe I'll just leave that up so you know how to access it. We have about time for one minute since I was so verbose. I have for questions for one minute. I really apologize. And if you could go to the microphone, because people outside need to hear you. Hi, thank you. That was great. Um, that was really great. And I agree with you that RCTs are desirable. Um, and, in fact, published a paper last year arguing for an RCT around this issue. Um, but there are concerns that people have. And I guess really my question to you is how do you – adjudicate the desire for an RCT on the one hand and the desire for women's choice on the other? Um, great question. Um, the way the RCT is currently being thought of is either a three- or four-arm trial, and this would be with women. We have some feasibility studies showing it's possible, where they would be totally voluntarily informed consent with these are the four methods to which they would be randomized. All have relatively similar contraceptive effectiveness. There would be two injectables, depo, which is the main thing we're interested in. Also, there's a second injectable called net N, which is a different progestin given every two months rather than every three. The third is an implantable, but still a different progestin, uh, largely levonorgestrel. And then the fourth, is uh, an IUD, and in this case we're using a copper IUD rather than the progestin IUD. Those are the four that are being proposed now. We're willing to take a three-arm because a four-arm trial using any type of um, realistic estimate of what the HIV incidence would be in these groups, a four-arm trial would be 17,000 participants, which makes some of us gulp a little bit. Uh, and some funders go, not that one in Seattle, but others, believe it or not. But um, at any rate, uh, it, 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 we're doing some pretty heavy thinking at it. We have an NIH R34 to develop a protocol in this area, and we get together regularly to sort of analyze how and reality check what it's going to be like. Another thing I'd be interested in, just some advice as we uh, scatter, uh, Another thought is to take only women on DMPA to begin with. And as you saw, that's a high percentage of women using contraception. And ask them if they would be willing to be randomized to one in four chance, or one in three, depending on ours, of, DM, of what they're currently using, or whether they would want to uh, participate in a trial that would allow them to be randomized to a different method of contraception that from their standpoint would be more convenient, just what do they have to gain? It would be every two to three years for an implant or every five to seven years for an IUD. So, um, and, and with the same pregnancy effectiveness uh, of method choice. So that, that was what was 
being thought of. But it would be within a trial setting, totally voluntary informed choice, just like any trial. Right. I, I, I agree. Informed consent is totally. I mean, again, it, by the way, I mean, all of this begins with my fourth time I've emphasized this, the foundational of women's rights, women's choice, what does she want to do with her life within that reproductive life cycle that she's tailoring her choices to, where is she in that stage? Hello, operator? Yes, ma'am. Do we have questions on the phone? I do show one question at this time, and if participants would like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1 and record your name. Our first question comes from Kay Ziegler. Your line is open. No question at this point. Can I show no further questions at this time, ma'am? No question. So, well, that works out very well. For those of you who can't see, Dr. Arallo is standing right next to me with the hook. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ward. That was fantastic. Ward is going to have two small group discussion uh, discussions this afternoon. He kindly agreed to do this at 1.30 and at 3 o'clock. They will both take place 